Let's get warmed up for Biochem 13. First question, what are the classic manifestations of Guillain-Barre syndrome? So first of all, you see muscle weakness, specifically ascending muscle weakness. So it starts in the lower extremities, then it ascends. And also, it's going to be symmetric muscle weakness. There can be some facial paralysis with this, and you can also see some autonomic dysfunction like hyper or hypotension or tachycardia. And then Guillain-Barre is often preceded by a Campylobacter infection or a herpes infection. Next, what are the risk factors for the development of hepatocellular carcinoma? So it's hepatitis B and C, hemochromatosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, hepatic adenoma, and cirrhosis, any type of cirrhosis. And the last one, what are the symptoms of TCA overdose or tricyclic antidepressant overdose? So you're going to see convulsions and coma and cardiotoxicity. So those are the tri-Cs for tricyclics. You can also see hyperpyrexia from the convulsions, and you can see some respiratory depression. All right, that's it for the warm-up. Let's get started with the lecture. To my good friend Andrew, hope you were adopted your hero, Dr. Lewis. All right, guys, so let's talk about lipid absorption, lipid processing, and lipid transportation. Now, first, I want to briefly introduce some of the key players and their functions. So first, lipids are insoluble in water, pretty easy. Now, this actually poses a pretty big problem for transport for the body. How are we going to get lipids to where they need to go? Now, to solve this problem, the body packages fats into things called lipoproteins. And as the name implies, lipoproteins are made up of lipids and proteins. Now, the protein is going to act to emulsify these lipids, and these lipids then are going to be more easily transported around in the body. So when we talk about lipids and lipoproteins, this includes a variety of things, things like triglycerides, phospholipids, LDL, HDL, remember that LDL, uh, which is, we all kind of know as the bad cholesterol, the low density lipoprotein, and it really isn't all that bad. It's just bad if you have too much of it. Now, LDL transports cholesterol uh, from the liver to the tissues. Now, HDL, or your quote unquote good cholesterol, uh, on the other hand, is gonna transport cholesterol from the periphery, then back to the liver most of the time. And a good way to remember this uh, is that L for LDL is uh, going to help you remember to keep it low, and then the H in HDL is that you want to keep it high. Now, there are a few other things, things like chylomicrons, things like VLDL, so very low-density lipoproteins, and IDL, intermediate-density lipoproteins. Chylomicrons uh, are going to deliver dietary triglycerides to the peripheral tissues. They also deliver cholesterol to the liver as well in the form of chylomicron remnants. Now, VLDL delivers triglycerides to peripheral tissue and is uh, secreted by the liver. And then finally, we have those IDLs, the intermediate density lipoproteins. IDL is basically just kind of a byproduct uh, that is formed when the uh, VLDL is going to be uh, degraded in the uh, serum. Now, IDL is also going to deliver some triglycerides and some cholesterol to the liver. And it's really important, uh, of course, to know all of these key players and their functions as we move forward. So now let's get to the hard part. So let's take a look at your study guide, and this is at the diagram of lipid transport. So go ahead and look at the lower image first. Uh, it has everything filled in, and yes, this is a complicated system. It might take you a bit to actually master this material. So uh, first, we're going to take in some dietary fat. We're going to eat something, and that's going to be broken down in the, into small particles by pancreatic lipase. Now these particles are absorbed by your enterocytes in the intestine, and those enterocytes uh, take those and form chylomicrons. So chylomicrons are about 90% triglycerides, so mostly triglycerides. They're going to have maybe 5 to 10% phospholipid, maybe even just 1 to 3% cholesterol. So not a lot of cholesterol, a whole lot of triglycerides. Now these chylomicrons are released into li the lymphatic system first uh, of the intestines, and then they travel through that system, and they're going to end up at the thoracic duct. And then all of that is going to be secreted into the bloodstream about around the level of the left subclavian vein. Now, to back up just a little bit, the only way that the enterocytes can actually push that lipid into that lymphatic fluid is with the help of an apolipoprotein, which is uh, ApoB48. Now, if you don't have enough ApoB48, you can't push chylomicrons out in the first place, which results in a disorder called A-beta-lipoproteinemia, which basically means the absence of beta-lipoprotein. Now, we'll talk about the apolipoproteins and pathologies a little bit later. So now we have our chylomicrons, and they're in the circulation. And as the chylomicron goes by a cell in the circulation, that cell might say, I want some fatty lipids, uh, some fatty acids. And it's going to use lipoprotein lipase to draw free fatty acids off of that chylomicron. 
And this chylomicron particle, which was once big and swollen with triglycerides and fatty acids, uh, is now a little bit smaller because some of those fatty acids have been, re have been removed. So what you end up with is a chylomicron remnant. Now that chylomicron remnant then travels to the liver where it's absorbed by an LRP. What's an LRP? Well, that's standing for lipoprotein receptor related protein. So it's just a protein that brings in lipids. So what does the liver do with it? Well, the liver will take that chylomicron remnant and then it's gonna synthesize a VLDL particle. Now this VLDL particle can then be secreted by the liver into the circulation with the help of ApoB100. Now, if you like ApoB100, then those particles are not gonna leave the liver. So ApoB100 attaches to uh, this VLDL and then leaves the hepatocyte and goes into circulation. So, as the VLDL goes into circulation, uh, it's still a very triglyceride-rich particle, lots of triglycerides, and it's gonna travel throughout the circulation and pass by cells. And just like with the chylomicron, those cells are going to use lipoprotein lipase on that VLDL, and they're gonna pull off more fatty acids. Now, as a result, it's going to become, again, a smaller particle. It's going to become uh, uh, what's called the IDL, the intermediate density lipoprotein. So that IDL can then go throughout the circulation some more, and it can be degraded into uh, an LDL particle through the actions of a different type of lipase. This is called hepatic triglyceride lipase, sometimes just hepatic uh, lipase, which is produced in the liver. And LDL, the low density lipoprotein, is very cholesterol uh, rich. You pulled off nearly all of that free fatty acid uh, from the particle. So it's a very cholesterol rich particle at this point. Now, if it becomes oxidized, uh, it causes problems in the arteries, such as formation of an atheroma, uh, which is the initial st uh, step of atherosclerosis. Uh, but this LDL can be reabsorbed back into the liver if the liver feels like it needs some more cholesterol. But the cells of the body also need these LDL particles as well. And so the cells are gonna absorb these LDL particles by way of endocytosis. And they do this uh, by using a clathrin-coated pit. So cells absorb LDL particles using a clathrin-mediated endocytosis. And this is again mediated by the LDL receptor. You gotta remember the LDL receptor because it can become very important in some pathology later. Now, if cells have too much cholesterol, uh, they can deposit some of their cholesterol in another circulating particle that comes from the liver. And we've talked about this before. This is the HDL particle. Now, the HDL particle can also take up cholesterol from the periphery by way of something called LCAT, L-C-A-T. And that's going to stand for lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase. Now, that HDL can deposit cholesterol onto VLDL particles or it can deposit cholesterol onto LDL particles. Uh, and the enzyme that catalyzes both those reactions is something called CETP, and that stands for cholesterol ester transfer protein. So CETP transfers cholesterol off of HDL and onto either LDL or VLDL. And then uh, an LRP, which we talked about before, that's that lipoprotein receptor related protein, can then take those LDL particles out of the circulation. That LRP is, again, just a very large family of receptors, uh, which will include the LDL receptor, which I told you before is very important. And if that wasn't enough for you, there's something called the scavenger receptor B1, or SRB1, uh, which is required for the hepatocyte to pull cholesterol off of HDL particles. So a lot of stuff there. So those are the key players required to get cholesterol and fat from the intestine to the liver and then to the cells. Now, I would stop the video, I would look over the bottom image again, and then try to fill out the top image while covering up the bottom. And I think this is probably really worth your time. So now we're going to move on to the apolipoprotein. So we just mentioned several of the important apolipoproteins. Remember that an apolipoprotein is a protein that binds to lipids in order to transport it through the lymphatic and circulatory system. So let's go through some of these in more detail. So first we have ApoB48, which we talked about before. This is primarily involved in chylomicron secretion out of the enterocyte and into the lymphatic system. ApoB100, which again we talked about, it's going to be found on VLDL. It's also going to be found on IDL and LDL particles that have left the liver. So if you're going to leave the liver, you're going to have, you have to have this ApoB100. A new one now, ApoE. ApoE is going to mediate extra remnant uptake. So E for apo, uh, uh, apolipoprotein E and then E for extra uh, remnant uptake. And then we have one called ApoA1, and that's going to uh, activate uh, LCAT, and this is uh, found on HDL particles. So A1 activates A and A LCAT, and remember that from our diagram, the LCAT was used to remove uh, cholesterol from the cells uh, into HDL. 
And then we had APOC2. So this is going to actually be a cofactor uh, for lipoprotein lipase. So C2 is a cofactor, so C and C. And that's it uh, basically for the apolipoproteins. Extremely high yield, worth knowing uh, for your exam. Now let's talk about some pathology related to apolipoproteins. So A-beta lipoproteinemia is a rare autosomal recessive disorder that involves a deficiency of ApoB48 and ApoB100. So again, ApoB48 is used for chylomicron secretion. Uh, without ApoB48, then your enterocytes really have a really hard time getting rid of all those chylomicrons. So overall, this is caused by a mutation in a gene for something called microsomal transfer protein, or the MTP gene. Now this is needed for, again, the production of APO B48 and 100. Now as a result, you're going to get decreased chylomicron, you're going to get decreased VLDL synthesis, and then secretion as well. Now it presents in the first few months of life, and the first thing you're going to see is steatorrhea. So how does this work? Well, without APO B48, enterocytes can't package and get rid of their chylomicron. So they build up in the cell, and then they can't really absorb any further lipids from the intestines. Therefore, all of that fat is going to, go, is going to stay in the intestine, and that extra fat in the stool then causes that really nasty steatorrhea. Also, these patients will have impaired transport uh, of the fat-soluble vitamins. And what were those? Remember, that was ADEC, A, D, E, and K. Now, on intestinal biopsy, you're going to see enterocytes that are swollen with triglycerides, and that makes sense because they can't get rid of those chylomicrons. You also see something called a acanthocytosis of RBCs on the peripheral blood smear. So this is where the plasma membrane of the red blood cell becomes misshapen and kind of spiky. And this is due to an alteration in the membrane lipids. Now these patients can also have ataxia, they can have night blindness as well, and that's from a uh, vitamin A deficiency, remember those fat soluble vitamins. Now treatment will include vitamin E, so vitamin E actually helps to restore some of these lipoproteins. So remember, uh, when you see ataxia, night blindness, acanthocytosis, uh, they might be thinking about A-beta lipoproteinemia, and vitamin E, again, is used for the treatment of this. So next, let's talk about when lipids become pathologic. So we're talking about the dyslipidemias, and there's really only three dyslipidemias that you need to remember. And the first one here is the type 1 uh, hyper, hyperchylomicronemia. That's a long one to say there, uh, which is an autosomal recessive condition. Uh, here we see a deficiency of lipoprotein lipase or a defective APOC2. So remember that APOC2 is that cofactor for lipoprotein lipase. So what you'll find in the blood are increased levels of chylomicrons, triglycerides, and cholesterol. And these patients will present with pancreatitis. Now, why would you get that? And that's going to be from those increased triglycerides. Remember, when you get really high triglycerides, you have an increased risk of pancreatitis. You might also see hepatosplenomegaly. You might also see puritic xanthoma. So that's from that increased cholesterol. And we'll discuss xanthomas in more detail in just a little bit. And the last thing you need to know uh, about the type 1 hyperchylomicronemia is that there's actually no increased risk of atherosclerosis, so no increased risk in heart attacks, which seems a little counterintuitive. Next is a type 2A familial hypercholesterolemia. So this is an autosomal dominant condition uh, with uh, either an absent or a decrease in the LDL receptors. I told you those LDL receptors were going to be important. So LDL receptors are necessary to facilitate the uptake of circulating LDL into cells. Now as a result, you're going to get a whole lot of LDL in your blood because you can't get it out of the blood. And these patients will present with tendinous xanthomas. Uh, notably, you'll hear about these being on the Achilles tendon. You can get the corneal arcus, uh, which we'll discuss in more detail in just a little bit. And finally, an important note, and probably the most important note, is that this condition causes accelerated atherosclerosis. And individuals with a double dominant mutation uh, can have heart attacks even as early in their 20s. So if you see a young, otherwise healthy patient presenting with an acute MI, you definitely want to think about uh, the type 2A familial hypercholesterolemia. And then the third dyslipidemia is the type 4 hypertriglyceridemia. So this is an autosomal dominant, again, condition that leads to an overproduction of VLDL in the liver. So you'll see an increased level of VLDL in triglycerides, as the name implies. And I want you to remember, whenever you have, again, increased levels of triglycerides, this might result in pancreatitis. All right, that's going to be it for the dyslipidemias. Let's look at some of the signs of hypercholesterolemia. We've talked about some of these already. So what are some of these signs? Well, in your blood vessels, you're going to get something called an atheroma. Uh, and an atheroma is a plaque in the blood vessel wall. And typically, these plaques form as a result of oxidized LDL particles. So it's not just the cholesterol itself. It's the oxidized cholesterol that is then associated with some inflammation even uh, that really causes problems. And it starts off with an atheroma. 
And then there's the uh, xanthomas, and these are plaques or nodules of histiocytes, which are filled with lipid. So histiocytes are your dendritic cells of your immune system, and they get filled with these lipid particles in the skin, especially around the eyelids. And an important thing to remember is, is that uh, there are xanthomas appearing on the eyes. They're called uh, xanthelasmas. So if you have a xanthoma on an eyelid, that's a xanthelasma. You can also have tendinous xanthomas, uh, where you have lipid deposits on your tendons. The most common location, again, the Achilles tendon, but you can get it anywhere. You can see them on elbows, uh, on the hands, all sorts of places. And then you have something called the corneal arcus, and that's a lipid deposition in the cornea. A uh, little bit nonspecific, but it's definitely uh, potentially a sign of hyperlipidemia. All right, let's move on to cholesterol synthesis. So we talked about uh, the absorption of fats of cholesterol through your gut and then how that gets packaged to move around. But your body can actually make its own cholesterol as well. And what was the substrate for making cholesterol? So it's acetyl-CoA. So uh, again, uh, you gotta remember acetyl-CoA is kind of the beginning of this process. But then you also need to know what is the rate limiting uh, enzyme of cholesterol synthesis. And this is HMG-CoA reductase. Now, don't confuse this with the rate limiting enzyme for ketone synthesis, which is HMG-CoA synthase. Uh, and then what are the drugs that are going to inhibit this whole process, that HMG-CoA reductase? Remember, you have HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. So these are also known as the statins, things like atorvastatin, very commonly used in today's medicine. So those are really the only three things that I want you to know for step one about cholesterol synthesis. It comes from acetyl-CoA, HMG-CoA reductase is the rate-limiting enzyme, and then statins uh, are going to inhibit that enzyme. And then finally, let's talk about some fatty acid metabolism. So remember that fatty acids are just basically a carboxylic acid with a long aliphatic tail. Now, most of the time, they're found in triglycerides. So remember, like, triglyceride is just an ester with three fatty acids attached to it. So fatty acids are small. And when they're not attached to triglycerides, they're actually called free fatty acids. So first, we've got to talk about, well, what are we going to do with these little particles uh, when we want to either uh, make them or break them down? So the main player in fatty acid synthesis is acetyl-CoA again, uh, which is the precursor molecule for any uh, fatty acid synthesis. So where does a fatty acid synthesis going to take place? Well, it occurs in the cytoplasm of hepatocytes, and you're going to synthesize things uh, like proteins and fats in that area. Now, there are a lot of steps involved in fatty acid synthesis, but what I really want you to know and what I think you really need to remember for step one is the rate-limiting enzyme of this pathway, and that's going to be acetyl-CoA carboxylase. So acetyl-CoA carboxylase is probably the most important thing you need to remember about the synthesis of fatty acids. Now, how are we going to break these things down? Let's talk about fatty acid degradation. So where is fatty acid degradation going to take place? Well, this occurs in the mitochondria. Uh, so the beta oxidation, or the breakdown of acetyl-CoA into groups, is going to occur in the mitochondrial matrix. And from here, you can get uh, ketone bodies, or you can actually go into the TCA cycle and start producing some energy. Now, the rate-limiting enzyme of fatty acid degradation is carnitine acetyl, uh, or actually acyl transferase 1, sometimes also referred to as carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1 be able to recognize both of those enzymes. So the first one, carnitine acyl transferase 1, and then carnitine palmitoyl uh, transferase 1. Now, what if you're deficient in that rate-limiting enzyme of fatty acid degradation? If you're deficient in carnitine acyl transferase 1, or CAT1? Well, you're not going to be able to get your long chain fatty acids into the mitochondria, and so you're going to get an accumulation of these in your cytoplasm. Uh, and they can't be broken down because the machinery to actually break them down is lacking. Uh, so that's going to cause things like weakness. You can see hypotonia. You can see hypoketotic hypoglycemia as well. All right, so that brings us to the end of the lecture part. It's time for that end of session quiz. Let's go through those answers together. All right, first question here, what deficiency causes familial hypercholesterolemia? Remember, that's going to be a deficiency of the LDL receptors. Next question, which apolipoprotein matches each of the following statements? So first one, these are kind of hard, activates LCAT. Remember, that's going to be APOA1. Mediates chylomicron secretion. Remember, this is out of the enterocyte. This is going to be APOB48. Mediates VLDL secretion, APOB100. Binds to LDL receptor, that's going to be the APOB100 again. Cofactor for lipoprotein lipase, remember that's going to be the APOC2. And then we have mediates uptake of remnant particles, uh, remember those extra particles for APOE. Next question, what is the rate limiting enzyme for each of the following metabolic pathways? So first of all, we had fatty acid synthesis, remember that enzyme is going to be acetyl-CoA carboxylase. 
For beta oxidation of fatty acids, the degradation of fatty acids is going to be carnitine acyl transferase 1. For ketone body synthesis, we're just putting this in so you don't get confused, that's going to be that HMG-CoA synthase. And the one you really need to remember for this lecture is cholesterol synthesis. That's going to be HMG-CoA reductase. Next, which group of medications inhibits the rate-limiting enzyme of cholesterol uh, synthesis? So really, it's just the enzyme. It's reversal. So it's going to be the statin. So it's, uh, it's, it's HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor uh, that's going to be doing that. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of the lecture, the end of Biochem 13. I hope you learned something. I'll see you next time. Welcome to Stepping Up with me, Richard Sammons. Woo. Woo. Step up, you. Hello, my buff buddies. What enzyme is involved in the rate-limiting step of cholesterol synthesis? Here's a hint. It is inhibited by statins. It's HMG-CoA reductase. Statins lower LDL cholesterol by inhibiting this enzyme, which plays a central role in the production of cholesterol in the liver. Now, let's get back to it. I said statin, not static.